And at the other end of the spectrum is marked where the cell nuclei lie next to each other with nuclear overlap. So a lot more blue that you see in that field. The next feature that we try and define in these cases is stromal uh, atypia of mine is when the nuclei are small and uniform and the nucleoli are not prominent. Marked is there when there is marked variation in the size and shape with nuclear membrane irregularity. This is the feature that I like to look for. I go really high power to try and see the thickness and the irregularities in the nuclear membrane. And prominent nucleoli are seen. Once again, this is a uh, field from, uh, uh, from stroma, which is high grade. You can see the, uh, the cellularity is marked. In addition, the nuclear pleomorphism is also increased. Uh, the nuclear membrane thickening, like in this case, we go high power. Here you can see the nuclear membrane is thickened and a little irregular. So these features go towards marked atypia. And like I said, these features, they walk in tandem. So if there's increased cellularity, you're likely to see increased microses. So that's the area to look for. And in a lot of these cases, the atypia will be more prominent. Another feature that we use to uh, try and favor or identify phylloides tumor, especially on a core biopsy, if you can see it, is the infiltrative pattern. So this is from a core biopsy and you can see that the edge of the lesion is not very well rounded or circumscribed. You have these fingers of stroma going into the surrounding fat. So if you see something like this, why do we not be able to call it phylloides tumor straight off? You would definitely not sign this out as a fibroadenoma. You call it a fibroepithelial lesion and uh, possibly recommend excision of the specimen. Very important feature uh, in these cases is stromal overgrowth. So this is uh, an area of stroma which is devoid of epithelium in at least one low power field. So one 10x field which is negative for any epithelial component. So this is an area like that. The cellularity might be increased. There's a lot of um, material matrix in between the cells. The nuclear pleomorphism is not uh, pronounced. However, you have an area of stromal overgrowth. So this is a low power field which is completely devoid of any epithelium. And this, if you see areas like this in your core biopsy, you can begin to favor uh, a phylloides, a benign phylloides tumor. The areas of stromal overgrowth are you know, responsible for the phylloides pattern or the leaf-like pattern. So if you have a lot of stromal overgrowth, these will tend to push the duct epithelium, uh, forming leaf-like projections into the lumen. We call this uh, the stretching out of the duct epithelium, we call this intracanalicular pattern, and uh, the morphology that we see is the leaf-like pattern, grossly and uh, microscopically. Stromal fragmentation is a feature that uh, shows up on core biopsies, and this is just an, uh, it's an expression of the phylloides pattern. Those leaf-like projections that you see because of the stromal overgrowth or the stromal growth on a core biopsy may resemble fragments of stroma. So these are just come become detached from the leaf-like projections. <coughs> This feature of fragmentation is something that we look for in the needle core biopsy while interpreting these cases. Having said that, and having described so many pathology features that we look at, it is still difficult to distinguish between a cellular fibroadenoma and a benign phylloides tumor. So the two ends of the phylloides, sorry, the borderline and the malignant phylloides tumors are not a problem. It's the cellular fibroadenoma and the lower end of the phylloides tumor, the benign phylloides tumor, which tend to be a diagnostic issue on a limited sample. And this has been well represented in the literature. Numerous studies have looked at fibroepithelial lesion, a diagnosis of fibroepithelial lesion and outcome following that on a more uh, expensive surgery like a lumpectomy. And uh, the outcomes have been across the board. 
So in a case where they had 57 core biopsies with the diagnosis of fibroid fluid deletion by this group, 37% were fibroid normals and 63% were phylloid tumors. This group also had similar uh, outcomes, like across the board, 55% were fibroid normals, 41% uh, were phylloid tumors, and 4% were fibromatosis-like tumors, which did fall into either of these categories. This is a slightly larger study which looked at 64 core biopsies with a diagnosis of fibroid epithelial lesion. And uh, the outcome was again split between fibroid normas and phylloides tumors. And all of these phylloides tumors were benign. Like I said, the moderate uh, or the intermediate grade and the malignant tumors are not generally a problem. Why does this happen, this kind of uh, equivocal diagnosis and mixed outcome? You can have tumor heterogeneity uh, within the tumor, and this becomes a compounding factor when you have a limited biopsy. So this is a case from our files. This was a benign phylloides tumor, and adjacent areas were very different to look at. So this area, if you had a core biopsy going through this area, it would you, you would most likely let it go as a fibroid noma because the stromal cellularity is very low. You barely see any nuclei in that area. There is no stro stromal overgrowth. While if you had a biopsy going through this area where you pick up a lot more of the stroma, which is more cellular, uh, you would probably call it a fibroid epithelial lesion. So if this kind of uh, heterogeneity within the same tumor would uh, lead to um, problems in uh, diagnosing these cases and also differential outcome on the excision. Also, it's been thought that a lot of, while most of these phylloid tumors, they arise de novo, there are some that progress from a fibroadenoma. So if you were to sample a, fibro, a phylloid tumor very well, you might see areas which resemble fibroadenomas within which is kind of um, exhibited here. There are subjective interpretations of uh, pathologic features, like I, I made a long list of that features that we use, but it is still not very specific, and between pathologists and pathologists, there may be differences in how we break these features. And I look through the literature to see uh, what studies were out there about interobservable variability, and I came across this study where 21 cases were looked at by 10 breast pathologists. So he's a specialist pathologist who read a lot of breast cases, and even within them, there were only two cases which were only two cases which were interpreted accurately unanimously. Uh, then they looked at these cases a little more and they saw that if benign phylloides tumor and cellular fibroadenomas were clubbed together, that agreement rate increased. So this just shows us that the difficulty lies between these two diagnoses. The two ends of the spectrum, the fibroadenoma and uh, the higher grade phylloides tumors do not tend to be an uh, issue, uh, issue for interpretation. We did a study within, in our department where we looked at 50 core biopsies with a diagnosis of fibroepithelial lesions. All of these cases had a surgical excision follow-up, and we found that 36 cases of these were fibroadenomas, while 14 cases were of benign phylloides tumor. We uh, we labeled these cases, made them, uh, you took the diagnosis away. Uh, and we rotated these cases for evaluation between five pathologists. Our department does a general sign up, so all of these pathologists, they, uh, are, they, are, they do not do breast specialty sign up. So the round one, we did not give them any criteria. Round two, we provided the criteria, and round three, we defined the criteria for them to see how the agreement improves or it doesn't between the three rounds. We found that the overall accuracy improved significantly between the three rounds. 
In the first round, only 40% 40, 40 of these cases were accurately diagnosed on the core biopsy, uh, which improved to 67% in round three. So if you apply those criteria uh, very strictly, you, are, you will get a better outcome uh, in diagnosis. However, we did not find an improvement in the Kappa agreement. It was fair at best, even after use of the criteria. So, inter-observer variability still exists. The other reason why there might be variable outcome following surgical excisions uh, is because of overlap of features. There are some features which are shared between cellular fibroadenomas and benign phylloides tuber like my native here, the fronding pattern or the phylloidic like pattern, uh, low mitotic rate and moderate cellularity, these can be seen in both cellular fibroadenomas and benign phylloidous tumors. However, like I said, if you use the PAP criteria that we've defined uh, carefully, you can improve your uh, outcome. Mitotic activity seems to be an independent predictor of outcomes. So if you have uh, more than three uh, mitoses per 10 hyper RT, these, uh, this favors the diagnosis of uh, phylloides tumor. If you use at least three of these features, are, uh, if at least three of these features are present in any combination, you can favor a phylloides tumor with about 70% accuracy. And if five to six of those features are present in your core biopsy, you will pick up 100% of the loyalist tumors. So if used uh, objectively, these criteria can help you be more predictive in your diagnosis. So you might be able to guide the clinician or the radiologist better uh, you know, as to where the risk lies for this patient. The next question that the clinician will bring to you is when to excise. So features that have been looked at uh, to favor excision is age more than 40 years, a tumor size more than 4 cm, radiologic features, the, the, the radiologist can pick up abnormal features, or abnormal vascularity within these lesions, and also change in size. So when I signed up one of these cases, I recently got a call from the radiologist who was following this patient conservatively, saying that over the past six months, the tumor has grown by a CM. I said, okay, maybe then you can talk to the patient about getting it out if it's continuing to grow uh, and the patient is 40 plus, uh, it's probably time to take it out for a more uh, extensive pathologic exam. Um, while we do use those criteria to guide us, there is overlap in both size and age range between a juvenile fibroadenoma and a phylloides tumor. So it's always good to remember that these are not absolute criteria. There is no, it's not black and white. There are areas of gray. We looked at these features in our cohort too and we found that there was overlap in both the age and in size between the fibroadenoma cohort and the phylloides tumor cohort. So while we do use it to guide ourselves and the clinicians, it's probably, uh, it's not an absolute feature to rely on completely. So following surgical excisions of these, what are the different uh, diagnoses that we have to keep in mind? Like I've been saying all along, the most common one is a cellular fibroadenoma and phylloides tumor. So these are the two most common ones that we look for. So juvenile or cellular fibroadenoma is about 4% of all fibroadenomas. And we call them so because of the increased stromal cellularity. Uh, they have, however, a pericanalicular pattern. So you do not see the fronting leaf-like pattern that you see in phylloides tumor. Uh, you might see a few mitoses, especially if the patient is younger, up to 3 per 10 high bar field. But this should alarm us when we look at the whole picture together. And in association with the increased stromal cellularity, we have uh, increased epithelial uh, hyperplasia. So there is epithelial hyperplasia also within this uh, tumor. 
This is a case from our children's hospital, which was signed out as a juvenile uh, fibroadenoma. I mean, this looks very worrisome. The increased cellularity, the epithelial hyperplasia also very prominent. If you go high power, there are a lot of microtes scattered in the stroma in a fairly epithelial distribution, however. So, but based on the age of the patient, the size of the tumor, this, and the lack of stromal overgrowth, this was signed out as a cellular fibroadenoma. There was no stromal overgrowth. If you looked at the edges of this lesion, it was uh, very well circumscribed. The next differential that comes up is a phylloides tumor. So in a phylloides tumor, you have increased stromal cellularity. You have stromal atypia. There is mitotic activity. And if we look at the tumor borders very uh, Carefully, there is a pervasive nature to that, uh, to the edge of the tumor. These are di uh, divided into three categories based on risk. One is the benign phylloides tumor. The intermediate group is called the borderline. And at the other end of the spectrum, we have the malignant phylloides tumor. So in the benign phylloides tumor, you have mild stromal cellularity with focal atypia prominent fronts or leaf-like patterns secondary to stromal overgrowth. Your mitotic activity is less than 4 per 10 high power phase. So this is a case from our file. You can see a very prominent leaf-like pattern here. Areas of stromal overgrowth. If you were to take uh, biopsies from here, it would just be a stroma. And uh, while the cellularity is increased, it is not uh, at the other end of the spectrum. The atypia is not very prominent. The nuclei look pretty much like one another. And on high power, the uh, mitoses were present but not very frequent. Edge of the tumor, you begin, you begin to see the lack of the circumscription with these uh, stromal uh, stromal fingers going into the fat surrounding it. The other end of the spectrum, the spectrum is a malignant phylloides tumor which has marked stromal cellularity with atypia and a large number of mitoses per 10 high power speed. Once again, these tumors also have permeated margin. So this is a low power view of a case which has a lot of stromal overgrowth, extensive stromal overgrowth and increased stromal cellularity. While some areas do not look so cellular, there are other areas which are extremely cellular. And on high power, you begin to identify mitoses uh, scattered throughout the stroma. The pleomorphism is also increased uh, of the nuclei. And like I said, marked cellularity with the nuclei almost contiguous to each other, touching each other. It's important to remember that rarely phylloides tumors may be associated with other sarcomatous elements, so this should not throw us off. We look for the fibroepithelial component first to identify that, and uh, other sarcomatous uh, components within should be part of the report uh, as you see them. And these may be angiovarious. You could have angiosarcoma, you could have a liposarcoma, osteosarcoma, lidomyosarcoma, rhabdo, and chondro. A diagnosis of phylloides tumor is made if the malignant heterologous elements are present uh, and it's the most prominent component of the stroma. So even if you don't see the spindle cell component very prominently, if you have a liposarcoma in the stroma, you will make a diagnosis of malignant phylloides if it is associated with benign epithelia. This is one such case from a file. You had a benign epithelial component with a lot of stroma, but it's important to see, uh, note this area where the fat looks a little atypical, and if you go high power, so this is the spindle cell component which is obviously malignant, you go high power on the adipose tissue, 
begin to, begin to see a lot of atypical nuclei and a lot of pleomorphism, uh, nuclear pleomorphism in that component, uh, lipoblast here. So there was a liposarcoma hiding within the stroma of the phylloides tumor. Also important to remember that phylloides tumors rarely may also have a associated carcinoma. Um, this also occurs within fibroadenomas, about 0.5% of fibroadenomas may harbor a carcinoma. Most of these are lobular carcinomas in situ. Um, however, you should sample carefully and look carefully for anything, any kind of epithelial component which looks abnormal and uh, you may encounter invasive carcinoma hidden in there. In these cases, the phylloides tumor tend to be benign or at most borderline. I guess if the phylloides tumor was malignant and you see a malignant epithelial component, we would be more likely to call it a metaplastic carcinoma at that point. So it's another case from a file, so you have a fibroadenoma and you have uh, LCIS hiding in between. So within the glandular uh, component, you begin to see epithelial proliferation of these very monotonous cells. A high power showing the LCIS component within uh, the glandular component of a fibroadenoma. So why is it important to uh, define the phylloides tumor as benign, borderline, or malignant. It is uh, to assess risk. The benign phylloides tumors have a very low chance of metastasis, less than 1%, about 10 to 15% chance of recurrence. At the other end of the spectrum, the malignant phylloides tumor have a higher chance of recurring, about 30%, and a 25% of chance of metastasis. Most uh, people believe, most authors believe that this is low risk that they've defined here, a 1% chance of metastasis in benign phylloides, probably is attributed to an unsampled higher grade phylloides tumor within the lesion, something that might have been missed. Is it possible to predict biologic behavior on excision specimen? A lot of authors. They use atypia, mitosis, stromal overgrowth, and surgical margin to try and uh, uh, assess risk. Uh, it's basically similar to the criteria that we use to create these tumors. Another feature that the authors have described which may result in increased risk are tumor nodules at the periphery of the main lesion. So this is where the main lesion ends. If you look carefully at the edge of that, you see increased stromal cellularity between the benign gland ducts at the edge of the lesion. And it is thought that these tumor nodules may be present diffusely in the breast and may give rise to uh, a recurrent phylloides tumor, like this you can see from where the tumor grows. So if you see this, at the edge of your lesion, there might be a chance that this patient will come back, uh, will recur with another phylloides tumor. So something to keep in mind. I'm not sure that we can actually give a number and say 10% of these will, uh, these patients will recur, but just something to keep in mind when looking at your case. It's also important to remember that brain progression has been reported during recurrence. So when these tumors recur, they do so at a higher rate. And it is thought that the heterogeneity within the primary tumor uh, is what led to the recurrence.